together and pray. The people of God said amen. It's preaching time. How many of you were blessed, are you okay, from our message last week uh, entitled, Take Off Your Shoes? Wave at me if you were okay. Thank you. <laughs> This is what you do. Everybody look at Chevelle. She has the shoes. This is a sign of what the saints should be doing. Um, I assume by your silence that nobody likes me after last week. It's okay. I've learned to love those that don't like me very well. It's a skill at this point. Um, but we're in a really serious conversation with the Spirit of God about the necessity of embracing your call. And more than embracing it, reconciling with it. It is not just enough. Uh, to know that there is a calling on your life. It's not just enough to conceptualize it. Matter of fact, it's not just enough to have heard it, either prophetically or through other people that have suspicion about your call. You've got to forgive it. Say yes. You've got to forgive it. What you think it cost you, what you think it did to you, how you think it situated you in your life. And you've got to reconcile with it. What I mean by that is after you have forgiven what you know about your calling, you don't just forgive it and leave it where it is. There's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. And what I mean is if I forgive it, I release the charge. If I'm going to be reconciled with it, I put it back where it needed to be. And so God is talking to the nation of Jesus Christ about where they put what they know about their call what they did with it, how they uh, 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 placed it and positioned it in their world. So this is why we have named this series Stop Running. Uh, because a lot of what we do under the guise of life and under the guise of rhythm and tempo is actually running. We're trying to avoid very necessary conversations with God. And the truth is you're going nowhere. The people of the Lord said amen. You, you, I'm going to say this in intro and then we're going to read the scriptures and I want you to hear me very clearly, very bluntly. You were created for your call. Your call was not created for you. One of you is older than the other. So therefore, when you try to bend, break, flex your call to fit who you think you are, you create places of frustration in your life and everybody that's trying to love you. I'll break in here and I don't care what you think. It's, it's a struggle to try to comprehend who you don't comprehend. And so friends and families and loved ones are going to feel that tension and that friction point of trying to love somebody you're still trying to like. But your calling predates your existence. And so God had plans before he formed you and made you a person. Say yeah. And so we've got to take this thing really seriously. I'm going to one of my favorite passages in the scriptures today. And uh, it's not real fanciful, I don't think. But we're going to talk today from 1 Kings chapter 19. And I'm going to be reading from verses 1 through 8 in the English Standard Version. 1 Kings chapter 19, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 8 in the English Standard Version. Go ahead and find your way there. If you see, as I often say, Judah Revelation, go in the opposite direction. Uh, scroll in the opposite direction because you're not where I told you to go. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 19, there's this huge, huge principle. It's really simple, but I'm going to take the long route. If that's okay, uh, even if you said it wasn't, I wouldn't listen. So I'm going to take the long route to get to a simple point. Uh, this is what the scriptures read. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I don't make your life as the life of one of them. And the heifer had a nerve to put a time step on it by this time tomorrow. Hmm. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now. O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. 
And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came to him a second time and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank. Here we go. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Father, help me to preach this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our, our dominant thought is, is coming from verse 3 of this text, but it's going to take me a while to get to where I want to go. Let's look at that again just so that you know how to take notes. Hey, Quan. Then he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He even left his servant there. The, the name of this is Lord, I'm afraid. You sent me a Catholic church today, huh? Lord, I'm afraid. Lord, I'm afraid. One of the most powerful things you can admit to God is, Lord, I'm afraid. I'm going to make you uncomfortable until you get some breakthrough, but I want you to admit this for yourself. Put your hand on your heart and say, Lord, I'm just a little scared. It is vitally important when trying to understand the biblical writ that you've got to consider the last chapter. It's unfair for someone to arrive in your life at this phase and at this point and attempt to involve themselves in who you are and what you are without considering the last chapter. Very often in your own life and in your own development, you make priorities and decisions based upon this chapter and you don't resolve and reconcile what happened in the last chapter. In order to move deeper into this and in order for you to partner with this journey, theologically speaking, you need to start thinking about what just happened to you. What, what, what were the series of events, the scenarios, the addendums, the details around what just happened to you? Because the real truth is this. If you don't consider the last chapter, you're going to disrespect this one. And sometimes when the last chapter is brutal or harsh or unpredictable, when you get to the next chapter, you miss very critical information about what God is doing and or saying in your world. Say yes. And I understand, I actually overstand that ignoring the last chapter can medicate some things in you and it makes you think that if you ignore, evade, avoid the last chapter that you'll be able to better focus on this one. But it's a deception. In order to appreciate, to understand, to partner with, but I want to use the word steward this chapter, you've got to revisit the last one. And I know that feels weird because very often when the enemy wants to torment a life or a story, he don't often use this chapter. What he does is uses the last chapter and uh, in this passage this is a powerful eight verses but what makes these eight verses powerful is not chapter 19 what makes these eight verses powerful is what happened in chapters 18 and then in chapter 17. So then, therefore, thereby, whether unto. If you don't look at the details and the storyline in the subsequent prior two chapters, you miss exactly why what happened in this chapter is important. Now, based upon what we know nakedly, Elijah the Tishbite is arguably one of the most controversial figures in Scripture. I mean, you almost have to ignore a, a major portion of the Chronicle books and the Regal books to see his absolute obliteration on the world and the poetic, but also the prophetic scene. When he arrives, he shows up in this ministry style and in this ministry tone like none of his predecessors had done. Before Elijah, there was no such thing as fire falling from heaven. They had to put it on the ground. Elijah was a reversal prophet. He had the power to regulate things in worlds that other people did not. So he was unusual. And I want to say this to you before we go any further to bless you. It is difficult to be different. I know that we're in a generation that, that seems to like it, wink, wink, and, and we seem to embrace difference, but it's difficult. Talk to me. You know, be honest. When, when you don't have anything that connects you to what is or uh, makes you relate to what is, it not only imposes upon us communication barriers because the way we've been groomed is in order for you to understand, I have to search for sameness in you or similarity in you and then subconsciously 
take a deep breath. We think that just because it's similar, it's safe. When some of your strongest bondage is going to come from stuff that understands you. Anyway, and so it's difficult to be different. It's hard to live in that. And so Elijah was in that situation all throughout these three chapters of his life. Now, what he thinks is his greatest war is not. I'm going to show you the greatest war in the life of Elijah. But the most obvious war is not the greatest war. The most obvious war is not the greatest war. The most obvious war is not the greatest war. If I can look at it, look at you, see the, the excitement and the explosive thing, I need to be more concerned about what catalyzed that war and what's supposed to come after that war. But if you think that the big thing is the main thing, you miss everything. So, so we have this situation of assumption and assertion. Uh, you understand how it was. And now everybody loves to talk, don't get uncomfortable, about Jazzy Jazzy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to wear her out. Everybody loves Jazzy Jazzy. You know, she's red lipstick and, and uh, heels and... She, she about a size four, that's what they say. Got a little implants, a little donk donk back there. And uh, uh, she likes to wear uh, fishnet stockings. That's what y'all told us. But uh, 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 Jezebel is a little different. First of all, a lot of the people that we call Jezebels are not intelligent enough. That's number one. Number two is um, when we're dealing with Jezebel, we're dealing with a particular mentality and character type and motive and agenda that loves to attach itself, listen to me, to any available vessel. It, it is not a female spirit. <laughs> It is not a female spirit. It is not a female spirit. Y'all going to stop messing with pretty girls because you got an insecurity. I'm going to preach today. You're going to stop calling people's huzzies and floozies and sluts because you hate your complexion and you don't like your hair type and your man looking at her because you lost yourself a long time ago. I want to know what Jezebel really is. And in order to understand this, I'll take my time being no worries. Uh, we, we got to look at what John the Beloved says about this spirit in Revelation chapter 2. First of all, what we know about her historically was that she was a Phoenician princess. So yeah, she inherited authority from her father and then married herself to a man named Ahab, who the Bible said was the most wicked king that had ever existed. But we don't see any spirituality in her life other than her covenant, listen to me, and her devotion to the deities of the land. I'll get back there. But when we get to the book of Revelations, Apostle B, the Apostle John says something about this spirit. Say yeah. And he says, she calleth herself a prophetess. And she loves to seduce God's people by teaching them strange things that's been dedicated to idols. So then, a part of what we know about the biblical agenda and propaganda and modus operandi of this spirit called Jezebel is she likes to teach so you can't be a quiet what she likes to educate she wants to multiply she prefers to make you think she's prophetic so that you never disagree with her opinion and so what she likes to do is float around saying whatever she wants to say doing whatever she wants to do but here's the most powerful point Dre are you ready for this she wants the future her, her, her objective is not who I love your word and what is today she's not worried about what you know today she's not trying to deal with what you know today what that wicked witchcraft spirit wants to do is assign itself in covenant so that she can cover what you see about the future. She don't want you to have clear view. Your word is light. She don't want you to have clarity. She wants you to be confused, discombobulated, so that you don't think that there is a tomorrow. Jezebel has an appetite for the future. Whether it's in a man or a woman, it has an appetite for the future. And so we see that historically the way she shows up in this monarchical system is that she shows up in this land. I'm going to take the long route. And she starts to make oaths, God be praised. And she starts to make covenants and agreements uh, with the gods of the land. Now, when you're dealing with Baal and Asherah, don't get bored. This is theology school. When you're dealing with Baal and Asherah, you're dealing with gods that claim territory. These were not the type of gods that liked synagogues and tabernacles. 
tabernacles. You would find Balaam and all of them erected in certain synagogues, but they preferred to be out in the open because a part of what their agenda was, Jordan, was if you worship us and you dedicate and devote yourself to us, we will guarantee you, listen, harvest. So what happened was uh, the reason why Ahab ended up in relationship with Jezebel is because he was dealing with the dominantly agricultural society. That means, watch me, my understanding of life, of family, of career, and health is I can only go if I grow. Pay attention. So everybody was a farmer. Everybody had farm investment. Everybody believed that if I worship Astrid and Baal and I make them offerings of myself, then they're going to guarantee me an outcome. Y'all ain't the first generation that's worship outcomes. Israel has been trying to worship outcomes and deadlines and ideals for the last several centuries. I ain't scared of you. And, and what they like to do is do and align themselves. Let me, let, 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 let me help you see how you do it. It's called hustle. It's called grind. It's called network. It's, it's called a base my conviction and my vow and whoever I am as long as something's growing, as long as I get a desired result. And so Jezebel was shrewd and made these covenants with the land because she wanted to guarantee harvest. Now, here's where things get problematic. Here go this old prophet of God shows up and God gives him a word. I could go here, but I'm not. And the word that God gave him was go and show yourself to Ahab. I want you to go and I want you to admit who you are. I want you to go and not be afraid to own the assignment that's on you because the announcement of who you are is key to opening up the reins. I, if you never announce who you are, there are certain things you can't have access to. So I don't want you going silently, nor do I want you going boastfully or braggadociously or ostentatiously. I want you to go, watch me, with a sober, honest, assessment of who and what you are. Ask me why. Because Elijah didn't call himself. Elijah didn't clothe himself. Elijah didn't ordain himself. He had nothing to say to involve himself with God's decision to make him what he was. He goes, shows himself to Ahab, and they're like, oh, crap. Here we go. 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 Here he come. Oh, they crap. Elijah shows up and gives a warning. He gives a word, and now the battle ensues. When he shows up, he said, Maurice, the worst thing he could say concerning both the civil and the sociological and the anthropological norms of that moment, he said the worst thing he could say. It would have been better if he would have showed up and said, I am Elijah, the prophet of God, the Tishbite, which means Romer, by the way. And, uh, he, but he shows up and he threatens their entire economy. He, he, he does, if you want to see, never mind, how to hurt a people, I'll go back there, touch the money. <laughs> If you really want to see change, ain't nobody studying the websites. They studying their currency. And so what happens is Elijah stands up and he doesn't preach judgment and he doesn't preach death. He says there is going to be a drought. Now that sounds simple to you, but when you're dealing with an entire area uh, that is held back or moved by and monetizes harvest and growth, I mean their medicine was connected to it. Their travel was connected to it. Everything in their lives was connected to what grows. And what Elijah basically showed up and said, ain't nothing growing again until I say, good God from Zion. And he stands up in front of the king and here's how he positioned it. Before the Lord God who I stand. I love that because what he told Abraham, uh, Ahab is, I'm physically in front of you but I'm not in front of you. you. You see me right here but the reason I can say what God said is because I'm standing in front of you but I'm really standing in front of him. And because I'm standing in front of him. I don't care what you think or say about what I have to say. I wonder how many people please us are people please us because they're not standing in front of him. They're busy trying to learn how to stand and look in front of them, but they've not learned how to stand in front of him. And so Elijah gets in front of him and says this stuff. And so now, uh, li listen to me, uh, 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 Jezebel's credibility is under fire. Her intelligence is under fire. Her business acumen is under fire because you got this Tishbite showing up and saying all of this is about to end. I'm about to shut the whole thing down. And uh, it's going to make uh, for some real complicated times for you. That's the end of 17. Let's go to chapter 18. Say preach. Now we got a problem. 
Houston, we got a problem. Mo, Larry, Curly, Shirley, Sue, and Barbara and Betty, we got a problem because now it's wartime. All of a sudden, uh, Elijah's life goes from preaching and, and uh, espionage and, and introducing messages privately. Now God's about to do a public thing with him. And in your purpose, listen, you got a private dynamic. I'm working in here. And you got a public dynamic. It's easier for us to focus on the public dynamic because that's not always where the pain is. Even if you experience the pain on a public front, you don't deal with the pain in public. What you're going to do is return to a retort or resort to what makes you feel normal and what makes you feel comfortable and that's where pain gets real. Pain gets real when they're not looking and pain gets real when they're not watching and pain gets real when they're not sharing or streaming or observing or praising or rewarding and so here we have a change of events and this change of events is dramatic because now it's wartime. It's public time on the Mount of Carmel. And uh, uh, Elijah is in this battle now with the regime in place. Say yeah, with the regime in place. And he says, I tell you what, let's end this whole thing. Let's go ahead and get the whole thing over with. I'm, I'm, I'm about to end the whole thing. And a part of what I'm going to do is I tell you what, let, 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 let's bring the entire supernatural staff of this region. I want you to get the 450 prophets of Astra, and you can get the 400 prophets of Baal, and I'm just going to bring me. I, I, I'm not going to bring none of the sons of the prophets. I'm not going to bring nobody I'm pouring into. It's just going to be me and God. And, 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 and let's just settle the whole issue. And so we get to the top of Carmel, and here we go. They go into conference. Uh, and they go into conference and uh, the 450 prophets and the 400 prophets started doing what we do. They started screaming and, and shouting and cutting themselves, with, which is always a sign of witchcraft. Wherever you see self-harm and self-infliction, you know that something dark is always motivating it. And you start to see them doing all of this stuff and crying. And the Bible said they did it for hours and hours and hours and hours. And Elijah was looking at his manicure. I need to get some no chip next time. Maybe I should have them buff it. I need to go back. He's looking at his hand, not paying attention. They keep going. And the Bible says they did this all day and they did this all night. And they just kept going and kept going. And so Elijah gets up and he says, this elder can is, hey, maybe you ain't loud enough. Call him harder. <laughs> He was basically telling them to Terry, no comment. And so they started doing it again and started doing it again and started doing it again. And he said, okay, I, I, listen, I, I'll give you a head start. I, I, per, per adventure, he's gone on a long journey. Maybe he's using the washroom. He's on the phone somewhere. Give him a minute. He'll come back around. And they start calling and calling and crying and crying and weeping and wailing. And then when it was his turn, he does something very unusual. It'll make sense in a couple of minutes. The first thing he did... The first thing he did, the first thing he did was wait till they were done. He waited till they were done, and then he said, bring me some water. Throw your hands up and scream, yeah. yeah. Now, the reason your yeah was so weak is because you've never wondered or asked, where did the water come from? We are in droughts. How and where in the world... Did you have the judiciousness and the prudence to know to save something from the journey? Because before, in this particular story, God had a habit of sitting Elijah by brooks. And when one brook would dry up, another one would open up. And when one stream would dry up, another one would open up. And the hand of the Lord would come upon him and would snatch him up. But it was always by rivers. I think the man was storing it. <laughs> I think he was saving it. I think he had insight that at some point I'm going to need to pour in a way I haven't poured before. I'm going to need to give in a way that's uncomfortable. I'm going to need to give an offering to him that's going to make them mock me. Here's why. If the families and the cities and the villagers and the rulers are hungry, they are in drought, there is no dew or rain, and you get up and you start wasting the very thing that we don't have, it's going to almost seem criminal and corrupt and opposite from the God you try to get us to believe. I want to know what you're going to do when God calls call you to do the opposite. You won't help me. I 
want to know what you're going to do when God tells you to do the opposite of what you thought you were going to do. I want to know where your water's going to come from because you're not going to always have immediate access, but lift your hands and say, I got a reservoir. You won't help me. I said, I got a reservoir. Do you think you've been saved all these years, praying all these years, fasting all these years, crying all these years so we could stay in drought? No, you're not who you're going to be. No, you don't know what you're going to know, but maybe somewhere in there, you've been carrying water from the journey. You've been storing water from the testimony. The way it seems is this. You forgot that God saved you. That's water. You forgot that he filled you. That's water. You forgot that he hears and answers prayer. That's water. You forgot that he brought you out of sin. That's water. You forgot that he paid your bills. That's water. You forgot that he healed your body. That's water. He even kept your mind. That's water. Don't waste the water. I believe that there is something coming where you're going to need it for the sacrifice. He comes up with some hidden water, some questionable water, uh, uh, some water that everybody else knew nothing about. And he wastes it, apparently. Hmm. Makes me wonder if worshipers have to waste something. They accuse Mary of the same thing, wasting the precious. And in this exact same scenario, the water is precious. You know, because it's what you're willing to lose that's going to always determine what God can trust you with. Your unwillingness to lose it, whatever it is, is going to obstruct, come on and open up, his ability to lead you. God leads losers. I'm going to say it because you ain't like it. God leads losers. And because you are so afraid of loss, of relationships and status and image and view and friendship and money, God can't lead the one that can't lose. Jesus, your Jesus, said whoever wants to find his life. Don't you take a personality. I'm working in here. You can read your zodiac but at the end of the day I can't lead who won't lose. And you got to be willing to lose your life for me. Now that doesn't mean to physically die. It means to crucify your ideal, your agenda, what you prefer. So we're at this place. Elijah, this is all intro! Give me some more water. Imandale kush. Give me some more water. That ain't enough. Give me some more water. Give me some more water. I'm prophesying even though you don't know it. You don't have ears to hear, but I'm telling you there's going to come a time when you're going to have to give more than what you think you got. Give me some more water. No, I need some more. I'm working in here. Give me some more. Give me some more. And there are hungry kids and sick wives looking on the sideline like, what is he doing? Giving up all of that. But Elijah had an understanding of the power of the offering. And because we only think that the offering is the money, and we only think that the offering is the cash app, we don't realize that it can't be no opening if there's not an offering. Ah, and what made this important was he knew how to open stuff. He knew how to get things open wide. And he did it by the power of the offering. But that's step one. Say step two. Open your mouth. Say step two. Step two was this. Before he went further in the signs of this offering, he got down and did something that if you missed this, you may as well walk out now, go home, don't ever come back. He repaired the altar that was broke down. Whatever those false prophets did broke the altar down. That means that wherever there is a false voice, false deception, a lies and a, a misunderstandings, wherever there is a broadcast, a narrative, or a sentiment that come from hell, that don't come from God, the altar is not in the same condition. And we're wherever the altar has been broke down, it means something false has been hanging around. He got down and said, I can't offer like this. I can't offer like this. I've got to go back and repair my altar. Let me tell you something. The next step to you finding your call is you've got to go back and repair the altar. I appreciate you trying to discover that. Oh, I feel a chill in here. You don't start learning yourself with yourself. What a foolish generation. you got to go to the manufacturer. And what that means is after this sermon series finishes wearing your hind part out, you got to go and find out where the altar was broke down at what place did you leave it unmanned at what place did you allow the deceptive of the heart the deceptions of the mind the deceptions of the past your grandmama's deception your granddaddy's deceptions your church's 
his deception. At one point was the altar compromised and repair it. Repair it. Put it back where it needs to oh, Put it back where it needs to be. Don't you just leave it that way. You realize you're compromising not just your destiny but the destiny of this nation. Ask me why. This next offering ain't for you to do a favor for one person. This next offering is for the nation. And the reason you got to make it is because if you don't, people won't see God right. He repaired the offering or the, or the, or the altar and he, he, is this enough water? Okay, the bullock is on there. I love this yellow prophet and because it's quiet, I'm going to take a long time. We're going to be here tonight. Um, I'm lying. There was a such thing called a flesh hook. And to make sure when they would crucify animals, Prophet Reese, so wonderful. You know, especially something the size of a bullock. That's a big wildebeest. That's a large piece of something. A bullock. I mean, we ain't dealing, my God, with a lamb or a sheep or a goat. We're dealing with a bullock. And he got it on there. And what happened was, Jordan, when you kill a bullock, the blood would leave out slowly. And then what that meant was that the, the nervous system was still kind of active while it was bleeding out. They don't like that I know my Bible and history. And so what happens is you would have to secure it. You would have to secure it because it would be considered dishonorable for you to make an offering that moved. And so what they would do is find hooks. They would attach the hooks to every limb on that bullock. You need to stop lying talking about you a living sacrifice because you don't want to be hooked down. Lord have mercy. You don't want to have have nothing in your space to make sure you don't move. You want fluidity? I know you don't like that. You want flexibility? You want alternates and options. But God's looking for a people that's willing to be hooked. Good God. What do you think Jesus was on the cross? A hooked offering. And so you don't want to be hooked, but you still want to be looking. But I believe God is raising a people that's going to be hooked before they look. Clap your hands for the hook. No, do it again. Clap your hands for the hook. Do it again. Clap your hands for the holy hook. You better not move off this altar. You better not move off this place. I've set you here to be sacrificed and don't move until I'm done. Now, you got this bullock. I'm almost there. This is 18. And, and, and God prays, Father, do this because you hear me. You hear me. You hear me. Um... That's what separates and differentiates, Jordan, my relationship from my deity with their relationship to theirs. You hear me. And I'm approaching you in this way so that you can respond. Now, after pouring this on there, the Bible says that the fire of God fell from heaven. An explosion came. Fire started moving down and the burnt offering was consumed. Fire from heaven. Fire from heaven. If you were at a concert today, all nations is prone to it, FYI. If I could find a way to get fire to fall from the ceiling at a conference, honey, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Imagine the dramatics of it, come on and preach this. Imagine the, the, the impressiveness of it. Imagine being an onlooker like, wow! Where'd it come from? How'd that happen? And while they're being enamored, while they're being excited, the Tishbite goes and starts to slay the prophets. The Bible said that he not let one of them live. He couldn't afford for whatever God was going to do next to be compromised by an alternate voice. Say preach. And so he killed all of the prophets that were around them. And then that was that. And then he tells his servant, get thee down. Hold another lesson, Elder Jason. Because I think we need men that's willing to go ahead of us to set it up. Okay. Uh, so, so preach, yeah, anyway. So he sent his servant ahead of him. Uh, to go ahead and make sure that the way was made for him to come and do what he wanted to do. I believe that the real reason, why am I here? Apostle Money, why am I talking about this? I believe that one of the things that a servant should do is make sure their leader is as undistracted as possible. So, so, so he went before him to clean it up and set it up. And Elijah said, I believe that there is the sound of rain. Go and get thee down. And he told him, do it quickly. Move fast. And so the servant goes, and all of a sudden, here we go to chapter 19. My text. Long way here. What if, listen to me, what if, what if the last war is going to bring a new fear? 
what happens when you go from fire to fear? We seem to think and act like it's the reverse, like fear keeps me from fire. No, the last war is going to inaugurate and wake up a new fear. And what we see now in verse nine, I mean chapter 19, is Jezebel said something, throw your hands up and say, talk God. Say it out I say, talk God. Jezebel said one of the worst things you can say to a man that's mad at his call, to a man that has not made peace with it. What do you mean he hadn't made peace with it? He did something. It didn't mean he liked it. Most of us do stuff we don't necessarily care to do. That's what an assignment is. Your calling is not a hobby. It ain't a habit. God's not asking you to like it. He's asking you to do it. And when an assignment comes on you, it's not so you can be excited about it. It's for you to obey it. You don't like that, but my plow is strong today. And so Jezebel sends word on Facebook, DMs him on Instagram, texts him. He picks up his phone and somebody says, hey, here's what Jezebel said. Listen to this, Jordan. It'll change your life. Tell him. If the gods don't do to him what he just did to my people, he will be just like one of them by tomorrow. Listen, here we go again with this principle about your problem with your calling. You've got an imminent deadline that always brings anxiety. I'm this by 25, that by 35, I want to have this by 40. So you got this deadline that's sitting here and the witch knew to put a deadline on it. She puts a deadline on it, but she says, take a deep breath. Breath with an F. Take a deep breath, deeper. Exhale. What if you end up like them? What if you end up like them? You may not be like them, and y'all may have different purposes and different callings, but what if you end up like them? Certainly y'all serve two different gods, and you grew up in two different areas. Now, I know you don't want to own this, but I hear your closet discussions. I hear your midnight meditation. I would do that. I could do that. But what if I end up like the people that tried it before me? What if I end up exactly like them and Jezebel use this thread? You're going to end up just like... Whose example are you running from? Whose example are you running from? Whose horror story is in the way of your dream? Whose death story is in the way of your life? What false wisdom are you using to justify your undue caution and unnecessary pretentiousness against the thing that God set upon your life, even from before the foundations of the world? It's another form of idolatry to disobey God because of who you have prayed to be like. Or look like, or to sound like, or to be around. What if you end up like them? Now, now you can't relate because another person ain't saying that to you. But as surely as Jesus is Lord, I know you didn't say it to yourself. What if you end up like them? And it gives undue caution and undue precaution. Now, here's what's crazy. She threatens him in this way. And the Bible says he was afraid. Naturally, psychologically, if, if Matthew L. Stevenson III, EDD, etc., walks outside and says, fire, and it happened, I don't care who in the Sam Houston threatened me, because I'm going to start playing shooting by the hip. Fire on you, fire on you, fire on them, fire on your car. I'm going to start playing games with my newfound ability. You didn't fool around and gave me a little too much. Bam, there you go. Uh -huh, I ain't like your hair anyway. I'm going to start shooting fire everywhere. That wasn't what he did. Something about Elijah's soul was afraid. Lord, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Nobody told me it was okay to tell God that. Ain't nobody ever taught me that that could be a whole prayer. Nobody said that that could be a supplication. When I have a fear and I have a real inward uh, 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 discomfort with whatever it's saying next, I'm supposed to keep it to myself. But Lord, I'm afraid is a prayer. 
Lord, I'm afraid is a place of intimacy. Open up in this church. Lord, I'm afraid is one of the most powerful things you could tell somebody because if you don't admit it, then what you're implying is you can protect yourself and you can lead yourself. You've got to tell them, lift your hand, say, I'm afraid. Come on, I know that these religious imbeciles got you thinking that faith is talking stuff you don't believe. No, I think you can tell God, in faith, I'm afraid. I heard you. I believe it. I receive it. I kind of want it. But I'm scared. And you scared to be scared. Because the reason you're scared to be scared is because the people around you have tried to beat it out of you. Tried to make it feel like if this was your natural reaction, I'm working in here, or your natural emotional fear that you need to hurry up and, and mask over it. But I know people that think they dealt with fear and ain't. I know people that renounce fear out their mouth and ain't. Here's why. When the seasons change, the fear wakes up again. Be very careful of thinking something is dead just because it's quiet. I'm talking about fear. I'm talking about fear. I'm talking about fear. I'm talking about fear. The prophet of God is afraid. The man of fire is afraid. The one who raises children from the dead is afraid. He was afraid, just afraid, just afraid. And what does everybody do? I feel like preaching now, Dr. Treadwell. You can't tell me that fear and running ain't twins. I don't know about that. What do you think fear wants to do? Not just torment you. That's easy work. All you got to do is give you a pain somewhere. You'll be tormented. What do you think the agenda of fear is? He want to bring you down and bring your spirit, man. Down. No. You see, because fear is a focus point. I'm working here. And, and, and what fear wants to do is make you run. Scream at me how. how? They didn't say it as loud as I wanted them to. How? Say it again. Because Tori, good to see you, son. They showed up on the planet the same day. Nobody had ever ran before before they said they were scared. Fear and running was in the garden. You know how? The Bible said that when Adam heard, Lord have mercy, when Adam heard, when Adam heard, when Adam heard God call him, he said, I was afraid, Lord Jesus. So I ran. They had the same birthday. Fear was not on the earth, but it got there when God started calling men. When God started summonsing people, then fear said, hello, I'm here. To, I want to know if you've not reconciled that the reason you're running is because you still got fear. I want to know if you've not resolved that what's behind your disobedience, I'm going to get here, is your safety in your fears. He was afraid and ran. Here is the crazy part. He says that he was running for his life and then when he found somewhere to relax, he wanted it to end. What in the scriptural paradox is that? Do you want to live or die? Make up your mind. You've not been driving this long, so you leave a destination because you want to live, and when you get there, you want to die. Lift your hands. You don't want what you think you want. What you think is most important to you, most significant to you, when you get there, you're still going to be empty, still going to have the residue of warfare on you, still going to have the same concerns, the same paranoias, because the issue is not where you at, it's where you're going. Lord, I've had enough. I've reached my limit. I'm ready to die. So he gets there. He's running, and he's ready to die. I want to ask you this before I go into my next points. Does it make sense to live your life being friends with your fears? I'll wait. Does it make sense with having a knowledge that you have a series of fears whether they are justifiable or understandable by anybody without realizing that there's no way you can fully show up in the world and in the generation you're supposed to serve if you've got an unchecked fear. An unchecked fear is so dangerous. Listen to me. It's going to mutate you, change you deceive you. It's going to break your children. It's going to ruin your marriage. It's going to keep you out of business opportunity. I'm here to break the head off of fear. It's going to limit your ability to commit to studying. You ain't lazy, you fearful. 
Fear is one of those things that's very fashionable. Hmm. It loves clothes. If it needs to show up as inconvenience and I don't have enough time in my day, it will. If it needs to show up and I don't trust people, it will. If it needs to show up and I'm suspicious and just really cautious, sometimes it shows up and I'm just a quiet person. No, you're afraid that if you're really your true you, that people will reject you. And so fear has given you a costume on how to be accepted from these people. But can I preach somebody out of a false personality in the name of Jesus? Everything you become to make them accept you and to make them receive you, let the costume die. When fear goes, your desire to pretend is going next. When fear goes, all the masquerading and the costumes and the facades goes right next. We got an unchecked issue with fear. Ran for his life. And here's why, Darrell. If I use my fear as a mental, personal justification to run, after there was this massive explosion, I'm afraid now because of what Jezebel said, here is my problem with that whole issue. How in the world is fear going to protect me from what she said? You see, one of the things that fear does is it likes to make you think it can protect you. As long as I keep this here, why y'all quiet? If I situate this here, then I can have a guarantee that if things go wrong, I was actually right. I know you're uncomfortable because you negatively prophesy over yourself all the time. You, you know, you like to lie and say the words I speak are spirit and life, but that doesn't just go for the words that are used and instrument by God. Satan knows the power and the brevity and the weight of what you say in reverse prophecy. You know, the devil likes to use gifts too anyway. And so he, he throws this out here and um, he's running, he's scared. I want to ask you a couple of questions. I got some points that's going to hopefully make you shout, Jordan, I'll pay you $20 to praise the Lord after this, okay? Right. Number one, <laughs> say number one. number one. Is fear driving your journey? It's, it's, it's rhetorical. Is fear driving your journey? How in all of Hades did fear convince him to make his next step? You're inspired by fear. He decided to leave where he was to go somewhere else out of fear. Is fear driving your journey? Number two, is fear steering your decisions? Are you settling because of a fear? Not deciding because of a fear? Not obeying or moving because of fear. If you ever put fear behind the steering wheel, get ready to crash. Over and over. You're not a test dummy. You don't want to keep allowing fear to be in the driver's seat. You understand what I'm talking about? You show me one man or woman with an anger problem, I'm going to show you one of the most scary people in the world. Rage is the manifestation of fear. It's not one before the other. You are this angry and hostile and volatile because you're scared. You just want us to think you're angry. Here's a tough one. Inhale, exhale. It's fear, this is all in my text, making you avoid a conversation with God. Do you go in prayer and in worship or before him? and decide that he starts fluttering in your heart something he wants to say or something he wants to show and you deliberately go around the topic. You know, <laughs> some of the slickest Negroes in the world understand the art of deflection. If I ask you a very direct question and you want to compliment my shoes, we're not getting to the issue. I didn't ask you how my shoes look. I like them too. That's why I bought them. What I asked you was to answer my question. And many of us don't realize that just like we are like that in the natural, we're like that devotionally. We go before the Lord, hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power. And God's like, yes, yeah, so about the last 72 hours of your evasion of this instruction. I'm working in here. About the last several months of your ignoring of this principle. About uh, the thing that I asked you to do 20 years ago when you had your youth and your vitality and your openness. And now you want to go back and try to recalibrate to do now what I told you to do then and the season is totally different. Are you avoiding a conversation? That's one of the things fear likes to do. If you look at the example of Adam, what did fear do? Don't answer to God's call. He's calling you. But fear will make you not listen. He's calling you and fear will make you not respond. Does this feel good to you? Now here's a real good one. Do you feel personally threatened 
by what could be next. Lord, I, had, I wish I had a praying church. Do you feel under attack somehow? Threatened, shaking by the possibility of what could be next. Did Jezebel beat you up that bad that now you're like, I feel threatened by what I ain't seen yet. I'm afraid of what could be on the next side of this, and so I'd rather just sit here and die because I'm afraid of what's next. Make a decree over yourself right now as loud as you can. Act like you're at a Bulls game. Well, maybe not. Let's do Lakers. Throw your hands up and say, I'm not afraid of what's next. Open your mouth. Say, I'm not afraid of what's next. Say it like you mean it. Say, I'm not afraid of what's next. One more time. Say it for your grandchildren. I'm not afraid. Of what's next? Is that what fear is doing to you? Here's another uncomfortable one, and then I'm going to expodulate this just for a little bit longer till I know it's landed. Are you afraid that your calling is going to make you lonely when you have to explain it, when you have to justify it? When it shows up in relationship choices or in timing choices or in career options or city options or industry options or when your family seems to not comprehend uh, the very complex nature of who and how God formed you to be and they start to weaponize your uniqueness because they want to be able to quote unquote support you. You think your calling is going to make you lonely. Why do I think that, dude? Because he confessed loneliness. He's under this juniper tree. He's like, I alone and left. You know what God said? Ask me what? I know you lied. God told him, I got so many more that's committed to obeying me. But only one of y'all scared. And it's the one that's supposed to be leading. So here is where we go from those considerations. I will give you a mystery in a minute. And then it's going to bless you. I submit to you that Jezebel was never the big deal. But here is our formula for recovery. My prayer for you is that through this message, you're going to learn and see in your life that a lot of your current fears is because of what you've not recovered from. And there was a such thing as getting over it, but it's not the same as recovering well. And in every area in your life where you've not recovered well, there is information under the absence of that recovery. You see, a scar is a message. A scar conceals information. So recovering and rehabbing something will end up uh, making details more available to you. Scream yeah. And opening up concepts to you that's going to help you for the future. And so now we've got this whole issue where he's sitting under this tree and he's sitting in this fear and he wants to die and he feels by himself. And here we go with the go. Wake up. Now you can say it for real. Say it again. Say it again. The angel of God shows up to him. Now this could make me clean backflip, but I'm not going to do it because I like my clothes. What I love about God, Tori, is that you ain't the only one on your assignment. God be praised in the sanctuary. You feel alone because you don't realize this entire time the only reason you've not been devoured is because the very same day God fashioned you, he created, lift your hands, a celestial staff. Don't be dumb. You're not about to do what God calls you to do without angelic help. And you know what I'm mad? At the church, we preach about angels like they love fat cupids that shoot people in the butt on Valentine's Day. Ah, but what we need to do is wherever there is a word is, there is an angel. Wherever there is an assignment is, there is an angel. Wherever the messenger of God is tired, there is an angel. You don't believe me? When Jesus came out of the wilderness, the same place that Elijah was, the Bible say after he was tested, the angels came, lift your hand, and minister to him. Get ready to see the brigade. Get ready to see the army. Me. Get ready to see the host. Get ready to see that you've got invisible help. When the earthly help don't help, you've got help. Lift your hand from the sanctuary. Angels, angels everywhere. And it's not a fairy tale. Tell hell it's not a fairy tale. Angels are real. They announce, they fight, they war, they move, they push, they pull, they cry. Elijah thought. He was a, uh, a, a sole proprietor. 
part of why his fear was there because he didn't realize that God had staffed him. Now, you know that this was a lesson because later on he teaches somebody else that. I'll get there in a minute. But the angels of the Lord showed up to wake him up. The hard hand. The hard hand. The hard hand. And when the angel of the Lord wakes him up, he tells him to do something very unique. And I preach this like I want to. The angel said, get up, eat. Let's think logically through the scriptures. If you are an angel and you carry supernatural power, you're not limited by a body. Why won't you just touch me and make me ready? Because that doesn't give you responsibility for the instructions. Eat. Throw your hands up and say eat. He tells him what to do. He does not do it for him. Get up and take responsibility for your exhaustion. Get up and take responsibility for what just happened to you. And I want you to consume whatever you need to consume to make you ready for that. And then when you're done eating, make sure you drink. You got to make sure that your hydration levels are where you're supposed to go. And what the angel told him was, I'm not trying to make you have a diet. This ain't about you being hungry. It's about the journey. What am I trying to preach to you for? What you eat now, what you consume now, what you take in yourself now is going to determine how far you can go next. You want to see why men quit? They don't eat well. You want to see why people stop? They don't eat well. You want to see why they're always throwing in the towel, walking away? Their only recourse or reaction is to run and pretend like it never happened. It's because they stopped eating well. And here's a problem. When you was a new believer, you ate well. When you first got filled with the Holy Ghost, you ate well when you first started inviting people to church and witnessing to them you ate well but something happened after caramel that made you content with your appetite something happened after the showdown that you lost the need and forgot to eat fear makes you forget to eat you lazy thing you you can't finish a book if it's about your calling you don't want to go and take a class that's about your assignment, but then you want to Google and YouTube how to make homemade shampoo. Boy! you got to eat for where you're going now. I'm working in here. Stop making more covenants with your hobbies and get ready to be devoted to your assignment. It's worthy of it. It's worthy of it. You can't afford no red bottoms if you're still trying to fight your assignment. You are walking in a seminar you should have went to. And the only people impressed are the people that have the same lack of identity as you do. I can tell you're not in your purpose because we see every dime you make. You're not investing it in anything else. You're not going and growing. Let me tell you something. If the world's richest man calls me tomorrow and says, Dr. Stevenson, I'm giving you 20 minutes of my time. I'm going to get 60 to 70% of what I got saved and I'm going to get it out. You know why? It's worth it. That's not a seed to him. That's an investment to me. One conversation can change your life. One confrontation can adjust your pace. And because you don't think it's worth it and you want it on your clothes and you want it in your house and you want it in your car, you're missing out on the stuff that makes greatness because you're cheap disinterested in yourself put your hand on your chest and say I'm getting ready to eat I'm getting ready to eat I'm getting ready to eat I'm getting Jesus said it like this my meat is not of this world but my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work I'm going to eat until I'm done Men that are starving never start. You must be willing to devour, consume, learn the world that you're called to do. The angel tells him, get up and eat and, and drink. And here's why. He tells them this really importantly, and I'm going to shift gears on you. Hey, the journey is too great for you. He just dealt with his loneliness. It's, it's too big for just you. Lift your hands. You see, the reason why you may be afraid to delve deeper into your calling is because you're not resolved that God's not going to let you do it alone. Your fear of loneliness may be in the way of the thing God wants you to do next. 
but you're not going. It's too great for you. You'll never achieve it or see it by yourself. And the Bible says he got up, accepted it, ate, drank, and he went in the strength of that meat for 40 days. You want to know my sermon? What if he would have died there? What if the angel showed up to him and he said, no, I'm not hungry. My appetite is not what it used to be. I'm not as starving as I am. I'm good right here under this juniper tree. What if he disobeyed? He would have had the quote, unquote, let's make some air quotes. One, two, three. The quote, unquote, victory over Jezebel, but Jezebel was an easy feat. You know what the real war was? Do you know what the real war was? Elisha. What was the next journey? First of all, you need to consider this. Why? 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 Did he end up at the same mountain that Moses did? The Mount of God. Hmm? Sinai and Horeb. God, it'll get deep in a minute. Moses went there. Horeb was the place of the calling. Scream, yeah. yeah. Sinai was the place of instruction. Say, yeah. yeah. Which means that God's not going to continue the conversation until you say yes to the call. Many of you want the details before you say yes to the assignment. You go to Horeb. My answer is yes. Ma, my answer is yes. Mandere, my answer is yes. Woo. My answer is yes. My answer is yes. And God says, okay, now that I got your answer, I can continue the conversation. Maybe the silence of God is because you're stuck in between the mountains. Horror feels better than Sinai, I tell you that much. Anyway, Elisha ends up at the same place. And you know what's crazy? The next place we see him is walking past Elisha. <laughs> Maybe the real truth about his destiny was, I'm calling you to make a way for who's next. You wasn't fighting for Israel. I've been fighting for Israel since Abram. You were fighting for Elisha. Could it be that your disobedience to your destiny has incarcerated whoever's behind you? It's easy for your kids to say yes when you do. It's easier for those that need you to follow an example and an exemplar if you do. So what it shows is our destiny, our calling, our ministry, our purpose, it's not singular. It's, it's the continuum of God. It's a chain reaction. My yes hits somebody else's. The real word is catalyzes it. And so if you got to know whatever, whoever that's behind you, imagine Apostle B, I feel the spirit of God, if Israel never saw the double portion. Take Elisha out of the Bible. And picture what those chapters would look like. Death, disease, Ahab probably still in power. But there was something that had to happen. Now, can I get real mystical a bit? You know, there was this lesson. I got a big neck, yellow. Okay, there you go. There was this big lesson where the servant of God gets in front of the prophet of God, and they teach him about angels again. So this is a continual lesson. There was an intimidation. Remember, at Syria, and the Bible says he told him, hey, open your eyes. God prayed, open your eyes, and you're going to see that there's more for you there out there. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant. This continual conversation about the angels. i got to give you a prophetic word before I go to my mystery. There's going to be several moments in your life when you need to be re uh, reminded of your angels, reminded that you're not just there alone. That, that many of you have angelic ministers and aid and support that don't don't even live where you do. If you don't believe that an attack is random, why do you think a miracle is? Miracles are divinely scheduled and orchestrated. And what it means is that the angel of the Lord are in places that you're not there yet to set up stuff for when you're ready to arrive. That's important for you to comprehend so that you can keep going in the detail of God. Say preach. Now here is my message. Lift your hand and say, Lord, I'm afraid. There was another group, if my recollection reigns true, that said, Lord, I'm afraid. Jesus told the 12, I'm getting ready to leave you. It's getting a little misty in here now. I'm, I'm going to go. It, it is to your benefit. What do you mean? 
yeah, if I don't go, things are not going to be well for you. I have to disappear. I'm going to leave you. But Jesus, you know we got abandonment issues. We walked away from everything we know. I appreciate you and James because y'all got each other, but we left our jobs. I have to go. And they said, Lord, we're afraid. <laughs> the way they said it is, don't let it happen like this. Jesus says, I'm going to do a couple of things to make sure that your fears don't impede you. Scream, preach. And I say, I want the mystery. Moses and Elijah went to the same mountain in two different generations. But they would meet up again. Oh, I'm working in here. They would meet up again. But this time when Moses and Elijah would meet up, they wouldn't be by themselves. Jesus took the 12 around a mount called Transfiguration. It was still a mountain just with a different assignment. And so when he got to the top of the mountain, here we go. There was Moses and there was Elijah. And they was talking about how to say yes to God. They was talking about how not to die under your assignment. They was talking about how not to run from a hard place and a hard call and Jesus became translucent because the 12 needed to see what happens when you go to the mountain when you live upon Sinai why did Jesus choose Moses and Elijah they were the only two that we know of that had them experiences through Horeb and Sinai so Jesus is like let me go through my text messages and I'm going to do something in front of the 12 to make you trust my next move. <laughs> I'm going to call them from the great cloud of witnesses because you'll trust them. You believe them. Your forefathers taught you, Moses. Your forefathers told you about Elijah. And I'm going to show you that I am their God. And they will be seen again on a mountain so that you can obey me. Therefore... And thereby, a man is only transformed when he's not running from his call. Nothing about who you really are will change while you still have a platonic relationship with what you're supposed to do. Transfiguration was not for Jesus. It was for those looking. Why would Jesus change his metabolic state, his, uh, his, his physical state, uh, uh, his anatomic state. He wasn't trying to prove anything. He wanted them to see this is what happens when you say yes to a hard thing. See through me and ask these guys too. Naturally, because they were still immature, they responded in religion. It is good for us to be here. But then they used Old Testament language to capture a moment. Let's build a temple. And Jesus is like, that's not the point. I'm not trying to build no more temples. I'm trying to build a people. I don't want you to try to hold this moment. I want you to see what I'm doing in the earth. I don't think you realize how important it is that you be completely, completely delivered from fears. I'm going to let that sink in. Because we say that over and over again, but I don't think we've logically considered what that means to literally not have a fear. Now, some of us have more than others. Some of us have, quote, unquote, premature fears, which means that we don't have actual reasons to be afraid. We just are living in suspicion of something. But I sought the Lord, eh? and he heard me, and he delivered me from most of them. <laughs> no, he wants all of it gone. Lynn, I don't know a person that's conceptualized a life with absolutely nothing to fear. And the ones you're most comfortable talking about are the weakest ones. It's your silent fears that's stopping you. It's the one that you've never developed the bravery to actually own and admit that's there. Maybe it's fear of death or I know the most common one is fear of failure. I've also met people, Rob, Rob that's scared of prosperity. What is the name of it? Poverty. <laughs> Fear is something that God has never wanted his people in because it's always been linked to disobedience. If I am afraid and God understands it, then when he calls me like he did Adam or calls me like he did Jesus, he'll understand why I'm not answering. But here's what messes me up, Tim. 
There are not many anecdotes to fear. There's one. The Bible does not give us multiple prescriptions for fear. Just one. But perfect love. It casteth out all fear. And where there is fear, there will always be torment. Maybe that's where your sleep went. Maybe that's where your focus went. Maybe that's why you're not inspired to get up and seek him early. Maybe fear has put you in a slumber, a comatose state. Imagine prophetically what your life would really look like if you weren't scared of nothing. I know that seems big, but so is your call. And your calling is a big deal to God. When he looks at you, he's not looking at your height or your size or your ethnicity, your gender, your weight. He's looking at his purpose. And, and, and the reason, Maurice, he did this in a garden, open your heart up. It was good. <laughs> he looks at you and doesn't say that fool, that idiot, that heathen, that pervert. He don't do that. He looks at you through his blood and says, it's good, because he sees his plan. He's proud of himself for what he put in you. Say, prove it. Here's what he told Abraham. Because there is no other name higher to swear by, I swear by my own self. <laughs> what he's saying is that he looks at you and says, I did a good job. It doesn't matter who tried to convince you out of it. You are a masterpiece. The very craftsmanship of God. He measured everything about you. And how dare you hate what he created. And you understand this from you to others. But reconciling this from you to you is a journey. And you can't get through it without devotion. This is why the psalmist would say, I wait patiently upon thee. <laughs> because from before the mountains were brought forth, you were God. You, you, you breathe and, and things change. And so because I am a reflection of the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, I obey you because of you, not because of me. He's beautiful, but his beauty is in you. We won't see it because you're robbing us. You're stealing. You're being a thief. Because this is not the type of life that's easy to explain. This is not the type of assignment you're proud of. It's not palatable for everybody. But make peace with this. What I love about journeying out of fear is that once you conquer it, you develop authority over it. God will never deliver you from something he's not assigned you to. If it comes out of you, if he breaks it off of you, if he delivers you from it, it's because you're supposed to rule in it. Whatever God took you out of, whatever he's delivering you from, whatever the background and backstory is, is a key and a clue to your assignment. Don't ignore it. It's negligent. It's irreverent. It's disrespectful. It's dishonorable. Elijah? Say, huh? What are you doing here? That was the conversation of God. What are you doing here? Go up and stand before me. And I'll cause my presence to pass by you. Who else did God tell it to? Moses. Same formula. Come in my presence and I'll let you see my goodness. And I'll give you what you need for the journey. Apostle, I don't have it right now. So what? I can't see it right now. That's not the question. I don't know enough. I don't study enough. I don't have enough money. I, f I fear, my God, persecution. I, I am concerned about if the audience of my assignment will receive it well. Jordan, nobody likes to talk about this, but there is a big one in the room. I smell it right now. I'm afraid to let God down. 
And I'm okay with saying I belong to him. I just don't want to embarrass him. Do you really think that whatever you are and however you are and whatever is in you and whatever the details about your life and your decisions, do you really think he looks at you and hides his face? No, he stretches out his hand. <laughs> come. Come. That's the call. Come. And in my presence, I'll show you, I'll reveal to you, I'll make known to you what I've got for you to do. Watch me. And then, as we, whoa, 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 as we grow old, because that's really why I'm preaching this to you, I want you to grow old in God. And I want you to grow old in God in your purpose, which means that in every season of your life, he'll give you a set of instructions. And in that season that is your assignment, in the next season of your life, the mandate will change. The joy compass will change. In the next season of your life, and so life moves in seasons. Don't just stay here because you want to know what the next season is. Devote yourself to what you know to do now and unlock everybody behind you because you did it. Your obedience gives people the permission to become the pleasure of God for him to be pleased. He's been drawing you a long time. I prophesy, we're going to pray. Divine, now they like to always say divine reversal. I'm tired of stuff turning around all the time. I prophesy divine rehearsal. The Lord is getting ready to take you through a series of drills, practice tests opportunities to see how far you're willing to go. What was the walking on the water? A drill. What was the opportunity to deny Jesus? A drill. A drill. Now, if you were Peter and you've been, after you denied Jesus, you think you failed the test. My testimony is every test I thought I failed, I actually passed. Here's why. It taught me how much I needed him. And that was the answer to the whole quiz. No fear. I will live a life of no fear. I will passionately, aggressively confront fear. When I hear it, when I see it, I will confront it. And even when my heart is overwhelmed, I'll cry to go to the rock that is higher. But I won't live my life afraid. I won't fear death. I won't fear disease. I won't fear loss. I won't fear betrayal. Help me, Jesus. I, I won't fear not having my assignment made clear. I'm not going to fear any of that. What I'm going to do is follow you. And so I'm going to do everything I know to do. And it will be counted unto me as worship. At the latter part of the book of Hebrews, uh, the 11th chapter, Robbie, it says something very strong. The writer of Hebrews starts naming all these great men and women of faith. And talks about how what they did, even down to Rahab, the stripper, <laughs> she had her only fans. And, and, and the writer starts listing all these great men and women of faith. But then there's a verse at the latter part that says, they were beaten. They roamed. Because the world was not worthy of them. They were very unique people because they didn't live under and around and for the pressures of the world they were in. What they had was otherworldly, and they lived in that. God's trying to deliver you from fear. Because if you live with it for so long, there's only one other place to go, and it's addiction. To something. What addictions do is medicate fear. It helps you to not feel whatever it is. And so God wants to deliver you from anything that leads you more than him. Whatever it is, internal, external, whatever that thing is. But today, there is an ultimatum in the spirit. Now here's the good news. We serve a patient God. Did you hear what I said, Zion? He's a, he's a patient God. He, he, he does not have an alarm clock by your life saying, hurry up. Hurry up. No, he's patient timeless. He would much rather you become it than try to do it first. 
And many of you are trying to do what you refuse to become. And it's because you're afraid. Lift your hands in the name of God's Christ. The sovereign, the, the Lamb of God. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I pray right now for everybody under the sound of my voice. In this room and watching abroad. Lord, send an anointing out from this place that will help men rout the powers of fear in them. And even as the hands of your people are lifted in here, I'm asking, Spirit of God, that you would send something to the root of every fear that we know, every fear that we don't know, every fear that we've cultivated and incubated within us, every fear that's been silent and Latin, and every fear that we've made excuse for and reason for, every fear that we've tried to garrison with, and every excuse, my God, that covers that fear, we're exposing it right now in and before your presence, knowing that if we give our fears to you, the only thing that can happen is you can feel us and make us what we need to be unto the glory of God. We're praying right now for every fear that was imparted to us, every fear that we received as a traumatic result of somebody else's experience, every fear that we started to cultivate and nurture because of what we've seen in other people's lives and stories and narratives, fear because of what's going on in the culture, fear because of what's going on in the world, fear because when we tried it last time, we didn't get the, out to the intended result results. Fear because of how we're doing physically or financially or emotionally. In the name of Jesus, we, re we divorce fear in every area of our lives. We do it today by decree, but we do it tomorrow by decision. And we do it tomorrow by decision in the atmosphere of devotion. Hey, hey, hey. We do it today by decree. We do it tomorrow by decision. And we do it in decision because of the power of devotion. Now, Spirit of the living God, I'm asking for a fresh revival in the hearts of these that are here. Do something in their hearts and do something in their quiet time that revolutionizes their ear to hear, their heart to obey, their eyes to see. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And right now, I make intercessory warfare on the behalf of everyone watching me. Under the sound of my voice, I make passionate supplication for those that are in the throngs of death, huh? those that are standing before huh? roaring lions and beasts, huh? roaring bears huh? that want to smite them, huh? either through the bloodline huh? or either through iniquity huh? or either through confusion. Huh? And right now I'm asking huh? that you would reveal yourself huh? as the fourth man in the fire. In the name of Jesus, huh? those that are walking around huh? fearing that the death order of the king huh? that wants to kill them and devour them huh? has left them without support huh? and left them without a help, left them without an aid and an advocate, but only made them be posted up against adversaries and opponents. Jesus, you've always been the fourth man in the fire. Jesus, you've always showed up in dangerous zones. Jesus, it is too safe. There is no need for you. You are the God of the dangerous place. You are the God that shows up in deserts. You show up in floods. You show up in flames, you show up in mountains, you show up in desert, you show up in valleys, you show up in droughts, you show up in want, you show up in plenty, you show up for the widow, you show up for the orphan, you show up for the brokenhearted, you show up for those that were abandoned and those that were destitute, those that are alone, you even put them in families, you show up in high places, you show up in the low place, you show up in the highest of heavens and if and when we make our bed in hell you show up there too God thank you for your omniscience your omnipotence your omnipresence thank you that you see all and you know all but we're most thankful that you are all and when we have you you are our exceeding great reward and we don't need nothing else all we need is your power your glory, your strength, your voice, your heart. I said your heart. Oh, yeah. Your heart. Come on there. Your heart. Your heart. Your heart right there. Your heart. Your heart. Your heart. Your heart. 
your heart, 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 the heart of God, the heart of God, the heart of God that waxes strong, your heart that carries the nation, your heart that carries the generation, your heart. I want you to lift your hands and cry out for that for a minute. Come on, do it, I said, do it. Come on, make yourself uncomfortable. Make yourself uncomfortable. Oh, come on, make it big. Come on. A new understanding of the heart of God. A new revelation of the heart of God. Come on, cry out, cry out. Oh no, you're not there yet, you're too comfortable. This is one of those moments where God wants your discomfort. This is one of those moments where he wants you to come out of yourself. He wants you to know, understand, comprehend his heart. It's about his heart. It's not just a task, it's his heart. It's not just a goal, it's his heart. It's not just an objective, it's his heart. It's his heart. It's his heart. Come on, Terry there. Terry there. Terry there. Hey, come on. You don't run for your life. Get up, Elijah. There's no such thing as running for your life. You only run for your purpose. You only run for your assignment. Get up from here. Your heart. Your heart. I won't rest till I found it. I won't quit till I found it. I won't go without seeing it. I'll never stop until I've got the kind of heart you got. Oh God, oh God. Adonai le mobris mi akwame mole mehoti ambare. Hey, hey. Le gose ba brune ki ti piantana mohoto maru. Lord, reveal your heart. Ow! Re Ow! Reveal your heart to America. Reveal your heart to America. Reveal your heart to America. Reveal your heart. Reveal your heart. Oh! Come on a little while longer, y'all. You have been wanting the mind of God, but you're gonna get that at Sinai. Horeb is where you find his heart. Hey! Horeb is where you find his heart. Sinai is where you get his mind. You can't handle his mind, then you can't handle his heart. I want your heart. Come on, lift your hands. If you don't have his heart, you won't have the power to trust what he says. Thy word. Thy word. Thy word. Thy word. The instructions on Sinai. Oh God, how precious is your law. How precious are your statutes. How precious are your judgments. I'm going to hide them. I'm going to hide. Woo! I'm going to hide them in my heart so that I not sin 
against him in the heart, the heart, the heart. Oh, it's out of the abundance of the heart. You don't just talk to us from your head. You don't just talk to us for words. You talk to us from the heart. Heart to heart, heart to heart, heart to heart. Hey. Heart to heart. Hey, come on, deliverance is happening in this room. Deliverance. Open up and yield to it. Don't got to control what he wants to do next. Come on, open your heart. Come on, he's moving in you. We are not distracted by what you need to be done for us. Because we're committed to what you're doing in us. Oh yeah, come on a little while longer, y'all. It's weighty in here. It's weighty. It's weighty. It's weighty. Yeah! Come on, let it happen. Come on, the heart of God. Oh yeah, come on. Let's do some dangerous work, y'all. Father, we pray. That you would give all nations worship a semblance, a brand new heart. Take out the heart of flesh. Take out the offended heart. Hey, take the broken heart. Take the bitter heart. Take the wounded heart. Break it. Give us a new heart. Give us a new heart. You're not done with all nations. You didn't quit on Israel. You're not going to quit on us. Open up this people and give us a brand new heart. Hey. And when you've given us that heart, write your law upon them. Write your law upon them. Write your law upon them. For every pastor. Upon every pastor. Upon every elder. Upon every prophet. Write them. Write them. Oh! Write them. Last time you wrote them on tablets and we took good notes, but we didn't change. This time put it in our hearts. Come on, keep going. I ain't done yet. Created us. Created us. Created us. Create in us, 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 create in us. It's not there. We ain't never seen it before. We don't know where they're gonna find it, but create it in us. Yeah. <laughs> create within us a clean heart. Had we knew the right spirit within us, hide me not, hide me not, hide me not away from thy presence, hide me not away from thy presence, and whatever you do, whatever you do, take not, take not thy spirit, take not thy spirit. Take not thy spirit. I don't want to live without it. I can't imagine life without your spirit. I can't do none of this without the power of the Holy Ghost. Lead us. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with that powerful hand. Uphold me. Uphold me. Uphold me. Uphold me. While I'm trying to follow you, uphold me. While I'm trying to trust you, uphold me. 
when I'm seeking your will, uphold me. Don't let me fall. Uphold. Uphold me as I obey, as I follow, as I surrender, as I confess, as I sow, as I sow, as I sow, as I sow, as I sow. As I sow, as I sow, as I submit, as I submit, as I submit, uphold me. So we can send it over the airwaves. I know you're watching me at your computer, in your bedroom, in your office. Receive the fire of God upon your heart. The Lord God uphold you. The Lord God uphold you. The Lord God uphold you.
yes and be him. Give him that yes and be him. As he upholds you with his body hand, he's giving you strength for the yes. He's giving you strength for the yes again. That's a fresh yes. Yeah. Somebody say, say, I'm lonely. With your body hand upholding. I'm lonely. With your tender hand upholding. I'm lonely. I said, shout. Come on, shout. Come on, shout. Hey, find your microphone in your own heart. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. Act like God just descended in front of your next decision. And he covered it with you saying, I will uphold you. No. I said, act like Adonai is in front of your face. And said, let's make a deal. Hey, 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 hey. Let, oh, 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 oh. Let's make a deal. Let's make an agreement. I will uphold you. I said, act like Jehovah is standing right in your face. Say, if you go with me. I can do run. If you go with me, I will uphold you. I will uphold you. 10,000 may fall at your side. 1,000 by your other side. But I will uphold you. They will help me, son. I will uphold you. I will uphold you. Therefore, no danger shall be me Because I will uphold you. I will uphold you. I will uphold you. He said, tell my people, I will uphold them. I said, I will uphold them. What about COVID? I will uphold them. What about the bankruptcy? I will uphold them. Hey, 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 hey. You ain't shouting. Yeah, I will uphold them. I will uphold them. I will uphold it. I'll go by myself. I will uphold it. Some through the fire. Some through the flood. Some through great sorrow. But everybody through the blood. I will uphold it. I will raise my standard. I'll lift my banner. And I will uphold it. I, I will uphold it. Hey, 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 hey. Come on, praise him. Lose it for a minute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let's go to church. Praise him right here. We know him as Jaira. We know him as Rafa. But today he's sent to them. I am your banner. And I'm upholding my people. I'm upholding my people. I'm upholding my people. I've been doing it a long time and I'm upholding my people. I'm upholding my people. I'm upholding my people. Hey, 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 hey! I feel arrested. I'm trying to let this thing go. Well, I'm trying to let it go. Lift your hands and tell your fears, he will uphold me. Lift your hands and say, he will uphold me. Tell your body, he will uphold me. Talk to your bank account and say, he will uphold me. Talk to your nightmares and say, he will uphold me. Talk to your torment and say, he will uphold me. Come on, help me. Hey, 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 hey,
I feel like running. He will uphold me. Oh, yes, he will. I said, he will uphold me. 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 From seeking sex. He will uphold me. From the miry cook. He will uphold me. Out of the lion's teeth. He will uphold me. From the grave. He will uphold me. Hey. Hey. He didn't bring me out to leave me here. He didn't say me to leave me this way. He didn't sanctify me to let me stay like this. He will. Wait. I, I forgot. You did an I forgot. Say right there. To give you one more point. And if this don't make you shout, something wrong with you. The Hebrew word for fear. The, he, the Hebrew picture word for fear. You know what it means? The hand you see the most. It, it means that if you are afraid of it, it's because that's the only hand you see. I did somebody shout because his hand is still on you right there. Come on, right there. His hand is on me. I, I just won't help me, darling. I said his hand is on me. Who has? Who has? I said, who has, who has the final say? Jehovah. I said, Jehovah. I said, who has the final say? I hear you, JJ. Who has the final say? Jehovah has. I said, Jehovah has. I said, Jehovah has. I said, Jehovah has. Jehovah has. Y'all ain't shouting. What I tell y'all? Come on. He's got the. He's got the final say. I have no reason to fear because God's getting ready to uphold His people. I said God's getting ready to uphold. Praise the Lord, God. God's getting ready to uphold His people. I just somebody at home watching me. I know you ain't done it in a while. Get your tail up in front of that computer and dance because he gave you another chance. Dance because it's not over. Hey, I said it's not over until God says it's over. He will. Oh, yes, he will. He will. Oh, yes, he will. He will. Oh, yes, he will. He will, oh yes he will, he will, he will, oh yes he will, oh yes he will, he will, he will, oh yes 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 he will, yes he will, yes he will, yes he will, he will, he will, yes he will, yes he will, he will, he will, yes he will, yes he will, he will, he will, oh yes he will, yes he will, he will, he will, oh yes he will, yes he will, oh yes he will, yes he will, oh yes he will, yes he will. He will, 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 he